welcome to our press conference with respect to our plan for transportation without tolls and without any tax increase. We call it Faster Connecticut. Fiscal accountability and sustainable transportation reform, which is the Senate plan for, for the ability to have transportation infrastructure performed in the state without taxes and without tolls. Next slide. So why do we offer an alternative? We did so because we simply cannot support tolls. We just can't do it. It's a trust in government thing that we know they're never going to go away. They have to go up in cost. Um, the tolls are not going to be temporary. temporary. They're going to be up for at least 2057, at least, I would argue, even further. But at least 2057, since the last drawdown is in 2029, 2030, and that's amortized over 27 years, you're 2057. The other issue is, is that toll rates have to increase. If you stick a toll rate that is roughly, I think I understand it to be 80 cents uh, a car, and your inflation rates in your transportation goes up, your wages go up, fringe goes up, but your income stays constant, you're going to run into trouble. So you have to raise those rates no matter what you hear. At least that's what our analysis shows. So what we do believe, next slide, please. What we do believe is that we can solve our transportation problems by having no tolls, no new revenue, we can create jobs, we can cut liabilities, long-term liabilities. We can prioritize projects. We can uh, have an accountability and vetting of all DOT projects. We also believe we have our plan to ensure railroad system that works with the state of New York. Uh, and the TIFIA loans can get as low as 0.8% in some circumstances. And by not having one project, but having a series of projects, we believe we could take advantage of lower rate on the TIFIA loans, and we restore the money that has been taken out of the SDF over the years. We don't have tolls, as we said. We eliminate STO bonding after 2022. So for 2020 and 2021, we are on the same page with the governor, uh, and you'll see why we, we are doing that. But after that, starting 2022, we don't have any STO bonds, which means the SDF is relieved of that debt service, which helps the FDF, SDF stay in a positive balance and accumulates. We do have $100 million of GO bonds, which is the same thing that the governor proposed. We do that, that excuse me, throughout our whole plan. And all of our loans uh, will be backed uh, as required by the feds. We have figured that analysis out. Next slide. We put in about $2.1 billion of cash into the project. So that's not anything that's going to carry an interest rate, obviously. The governor puts in just shy of $2 billion. We're about $300 million more than the governor in terms of cash, which means we borrow less, once again, again, easing the issue of interest costs and debt liability. Next slide. We also believe we have to put back the Transportation Strategy Board. This is a board that existed back in Roland and Rel. Governor Malloy got rid of it. One of the first things he did when he became governor is he got rid of that board. And although we have money, as you'll see, for transportation, all these projects must be vetted through the TSB. And we expect that these projects are going to be put forth, we say, within four months after if this bill passes in some form, four months they come through and they say what the priority projects are, how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take, what traffic impacts they're going to be, and what is the benefit to the state of Connecticut. We believe that this TSB needs to do a recommendation or not recommendation, kind of like in committee where you have favorable and unfavorable, same type of thing. The legislature and the governor can make decisions whether it's a go or no go, but we need that feedback. And this is how you get accountability, which is lacking at DOT right now. We need that accountability. This would also include accountability for maintenance issues. We believe that the maintenance that's being done around this state may be done prudently, may not be. 
But I think folks who have knowledge of transportation should be on this committee, much like we had in the past. We also want to establish a New York, Connecticut Rail Strategy Board. We would seek out the folks on the New York MTA Committee, which there are a lot of people, we looked it up. We would get folks from the Connecticut Consumer uh, Railroad Committee that does exist in the state of Connecticut. And then a variety of other people which we're open to suggestions for who would know most about rail. Fixing rail from Connecticut to the New York border doesn't solve the rail problem. The rail problem uh, also is between New York and Manhattan, an example. 125th Street, I am told, the rails start above ground and then go below ground. They have a signalization problem and some other issues. So if we had more rail cars or more rail service, but it's being bottleneck at 125th Street, we're not getting people to Manhattan. So we need to work with New York, however that works, so we can make sure we have a seamless transition of our folks who have to get to New York to New York Otherwise, we're wasting money in the rail. So we need to work with them. I will say I think Governor Lamont's done a great job in opening in those doors. Um, I think he has a working relationship with New York, at least a dialogue, which we never had under the Malloy administration for, for a variety of reasons. And I think that's going to prove very beneficial if we put this board together. Next slide. So how do we kind of get there? What we propose to do is to take from our rainy day fund, we propose to take, our rainy day fund is about 2.7 billion, at, would be at the end of the exchange at the end of 2020. If we take 1.5 billion of that money and we pay off pension liabilities, that would free up some cash at the GF level and at the SDF level. So why would you want to do that? You're, Right now, you're earning about 2% interest, maybe a little less than that, on your rainy day fund. And you're paying out a 6.9% or better at your liability fund. So if you had a savings account that was earning a half a percent, and you had a credit card that's earning you, that you're paying 23%, why would you not take your savings and pay down on your debt, reducing your liability and freeing up your cash flow uh, on a monthly or yearly basis. Of course you would. That's what you would do. We should do nothing less. That still leaves the BRF fund in a positive cash flow, or I should say at a historical level, at $1.2 billion. And you're going to see some numbers in a second. This is not a raid on the budget reserve fund. It's not a raid on a budget reserve fund. Because a raid on a budget reserve fund is when you take it and use it for one-time expenses. When you're doing it to pay off liabilities and reducing your cash flow from earning 2% to saving 6.9 or better, that's prudent fiscal realities of what you do with money. Next slide. Under Connecticut state law, we have the legislature, and this is the intent of the legislature. The legislature said under state law that in excess of 5%, the budget reserve fund can, upon a vote of the legislature, pay off liabilities to either state employees' retirement system or teachers' retirement system, says in consultation with the treasurer. But you, it's already contemplated in our law that we would do this. Now, remember what the bipartisan budget did that's carried over. We have a... Uh, level for which after $3.1 billion of income, every dollar after that has to go in a rainy day fund. And we did that because we wanted that money to pay off liabilities. When you exceed 15%, it automatically pays off liabilities. But we left ourselves room that if it's fiscally prudent between the 5 and the 15%, we may want to do it. I would argue, based upon a low interest rates we're getting on holding it, based upon the great debt service we have carrying the liability and the need to get some free, some cash so we can do things like infrastructure in the state of Connecticut and move it forward for economic opportunity, this is a great investment in ourselves. We've taxed people to a point that we've got extra money. This is the way you give it back to them in terms of investment in the state of Connecticut to get the state of Connecticut to grow. Next slide. 
So it's fiscally, it's good fiscal policy. It helps taxpayers because we're not asking them to cough up more money by way of tolls or other sources of revenue. And we're showing them that we're taking your money that we have and we're investing it back into the state of Connecticut. It helps workers because everyone knows that our pension liabilities are huge in the state. So we are paying down 1.5. I remember when we did the teachers way back when, we borrowed money to pay the teachers pension plan way back when, and it was a great thing that we did to knock down those liabilities even though we borrowed it. Here we're not borrowing it, we're putting in our own cash. Next slide. So, I don't wanna drift over there, but so this is OFA's analysis. Looks like a lot of numbers, it's really not that bad. OFA's analysis, in fiscal year 20, we have $2.5 billion in the budget reserve fund. If we take out what's in red, the 1.5 billion, thank you, Kevin, the 1.5 billion and pay the pension liability, there's roughly $30 million that OFA reported, up one, $29.7 billion, that's a shortfall in our budget that can come out of the rainy day fund. And the $30 million, which is the next line down, is the hospital deal that they're working on. There's anticipation it's gonna cost about $30 million for that to work. The 318 below the 30 million is the volatility cap. That is the money that must go into the rainy day fund under the rules we set in the bipartisan budget. So once we pay the money, we got 1.2. The following year, the budget has $183 million surplus 183.7 million dollar surplus, plus what we put in the volatility, we get 1.7. So even if we take the 1.5, if you go all the way to 2024, thank you, Vanna White. If you go all the way down to, if you go down to 2024, we're back up to 2.5 billion dollars in our rainy day fund. So what we've done is we've taken 1.5 out now. We decrease our liabilities, we invest in transportation, we build our infrastructure, we build our businesses in the state of Connecticut, we attract them, we put cash into the deal, and at the end of 2024, we have back to $2.5 billion in a rainy day fund. So I know what the question's gonna be, so I'll get to it now. So Len, what happens if there's a recession? Next slide. So there it is, what if there is a recession? We still have an historic amount in our rainy day fund, $1.2 billion. So we're still gonna have that historic amount. And also, as I said, we'll have 2.5 by 2024. The last big recession we had was 2008. A couple things that we have done purposely as a bipartisan group is to protect against that type of issue ever again. We only budget to 9.95 and it goes down to 9.8 of the total revenues. So we built in a cushion in our budget in case we have some sort of recession. In addition to that, now we have a spending cap, a volatility cap, a revenue cap, a bonding cap, all that was put in. So we would not overextend ourselves and we'd be able to protect ourselves against a recession. I would also add for those of you who were here in 2008, the reaction by the legislature to fix the downfall in the economy was a huge misstep by the legislature. Many of us in the legislature will remember, we would say, we have to fix the budget. There's a deficit coming up in June. It was October, November. Let's go in and fix the budget. We heard, wait for Christmas. The sales are gonna go up. It's gonna come back. We should wait for the sales tax number. Then it was, let's wait for the corporate quarterlies. Then it was, let's wait for the estimates. Let's wait for April 15th. And when none of that rebounded, they ended up having to take money or, excuse me, utilize the money in the rainy day fund. So we think it's a lesson learned, and if we act quicker, plus those safeguards, we believe we can protect ourselves against the recession, should it come. Next slide. So those are a lot of numbers. So basically, I'm not gonna go through all these numbers, but in 2021, it's the same as the governor. What I wanna point out is in 2022, uh, when you get down to expenditures, you'll see STF debt service, Kevin, right under expenditures. Up, up, keep going. Uh, go to 2022. 
Yep, right. Go up. Go up there. Up. Keep going to the top of that column. That's the yes. That's the STF debt service. Now that debt service, as you look, goes down because we are not borrowing any more STF bonds. So you can see that number starts to go down. So that's the old bonds trailing off. Then you have underneath that, you have the TIF and RIF money. That's a debt service associated with the TIF and RIF money. That's the same exact debt service the governor uses. So we're following his plan. And so the total debt service that we have is, is indicated there, which is just sort of the same as the governor's. We pick up $14 million in the STF, which is right there. That's because we pay off the unfunded liabilities, we get 14 million extra money in the SDF. Now, the 113 million is a savings to the GF. And what we did was we took the liabilities associated with fringe, moved that out of the STF where it should never be. It was put in the SDF historically because to balance the budget, they moved it into the SDF because back in the day we had a lot more money in the SDF. We take the fringe and we move it over to the general fund because when we pay down, we have more money there. We move that over. That means we have 113 million. That's about half the fringe costs in the SDF. We move to the GF where it belongs. It makes the SDF more pure because now it's more transportation related and doesn't have those other things attached to it. And those are the expenditures. Our operating surplus, uh, yep, our operating surplus is good. Our accumulated surplus is good. We do what the governor did. We take 15% of that accumulated balance and we put that in as cash into the deal. That's how we get the $21.9 uh, billion dollars that we use. Uh, and our debt ratio that we have to be above 2% obviously stays uh, oh, 18, but the uh, number stays the same on the uh, debt service, stays high greater than two at a significant rate. So we have a healthy STF, we have a healthy debt ratio, we're putting in more cash of $2.1 billion. $2 billion. Um, so we believe that this is the way to go for transportation. Next slide, I think. So. How do we get, what money, how much money are we putting in the deal? So we are putting in, Vanna, we are putting in, pick up in 2022, Kevin. So we are putting in down $300 million of cash, which is what we're putting in. We got 100 million GO bonds. We got a RIF of 360. We got the TIFIA of 100. We got the federal grant. So we got 1.6 billion. If you play that out all the way to the end, we have 17.9, call it $18 billion that we are putting into transportation. And the key to that is that's not the beginning or that's not the end of the construction. That's just the first 10 years. As you play this out, you could continue that pattern on if you wanted to, if you needed more projects. But it's consistent, it's funded, and it's 18 billion. Just so you remember, the governor had 21 billion. Uh, the way we figured this out was this. The governor needed 3.2 billion for bridges, 5.8 billion for rail, let's call that 9 billion, and then they added the DOT wish list, which was $10 billion. That's 19 billion. We're at 18 billion. We're, we're, we're pretty close. And if you look at that DOT wish list, with all due respect to DOT, there's a lot of placeholders on that list. There's a lot of changing of signs. There's a lot of, we need money for, in, for intersections, but we don't know where they are right now. So there's a lot of stuff that I think can be weeded out. Thus, the reason why we need the TSB. If the TSB is involved, they could go through that list, I think pare it down, figure out what the real priorities are. DOT comes with the ideas, and then they get vetted out. So it's not just giving DOT 18 billion, it's saying you've got up to 18 billion, but you're gonna get this accountability and review by folks who understand this stuff and do this as a living to see if the projects make sense for the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. But 18 billion certainly is a heck of a lot of money that we're giving to transportation guaranteed 
where they never really had that guarantee before, and they can plan. By using the federal RIF and TIFIA money, we're using the federal low interest rate loans that have never been used in Connecticut. In fact, nor, no Northeast state has ever used those loans amount. New York has and a bunch of other states. For reasons unknown, Northeast hasn't. So when I was uh, in Washington uh, with Ryan and we met, uh, we were told that they would love to have Connecticut do this program so that the Northeast could see uh, how this program can benefit the uh, transportation system in the Northeast. I would also add to that that I think that encouragement means they'll work very well with us. So if the as we pan out these numbers, I think we could get a better result. This is sort of still has to be vetted through uh, feds in terms of getting all the uh, T's crossed and I dotted. And the point of this was to show that there's another way of doing transportation in a meaningful, sustainable, affordable, with the oversight that is required in order to move Connecticut forward and bring, bring the trust that I think taxpayers are looking to for transportation. And by the way, Kevin is reminding me, we have had all of those numbers vetted by OFA. We've been working on this for about three or four weeks. All these numbers have been, we had many plans, I want you to know that. We had four or five different scenarios that we ran numbers, checked numbers with OFA, but this turned out to be the one that we felt made sense, was affordable, and we could keep a commitment to the state of Connecticut. Uh, I will also say this, I, I applaud the governor because the governor has done something no other governor has done. He has said we have to look at transportation not about just highways, not about just bridges, not about just rail. He said we have to look at it holistically. And he came up with a methodical plan. This, these numbers or this plan takes what he wants to do and figures out a way to pay for it. So we use, because I believe that he's doing it the right way, we use his construction plan and then figure out how to pay for it. That's the only difference between his plan and my plan, our plan, is that how to pay for it. That's the issue, but we use his ideas. And I'm gonna ask someone who's given unselfish time to this toll issue and transportation, Henry Martin, to make a few comments. Henry. Thank you, Len. So in January uh, of this past year, as a ranking member of uh, the Transportation Committee, uh, Representative Laura Devlin and myself uh, believed that, that if the state taxpayers were provided the facts, uh, that they would uh, reject the idea of tolls altogether. So we went to the people and we held some public forums and we traveled to all four corners of the state and we started in Fairfield, we went up to Old Lyme, to Grot and to Killingly, to Vernon, Enfield, and uh, don't forget the middle of the state with Wallingford, Bristol, Torrington, back down to Danbury, and we wrapped up in Greenwich and even the governor joined us there. So we simply provided the people the facts. We heard them crystal clear as a result of that. And the people believe that they were taxed enough. Equally important, the people were very concerned, I'll repeat that, very concerned about trusting government to manage a new revenue source. Whether it was 82 gantries, 53 gantries, or currently the 14 gantries that are being proposed, it was very clear. The people do not want tolls because they are taxed enough and because of lack of trust. Our plan provides a solution without tolls and without new taxes. This plan puts the wishes of the Connecticut people first. We hope that it's embraced so that our state can move forward towards fiscal stability and take care of the state's transportation infrastructure. This is a plan for the future of transportation of Connecticut. Thank you. So the last thing I would just add to this is that this plan we're putting forth, uh, and we have emailed all the leaders the 
PowerPoint that you see here for them to look at. Um, I did meet with the governor's office last night and went through this PowerPoint with uh, Ryan last night. Um, and the idea is not saying, we're putting it out there for discussion purposes, there's an alternative plan, we want them to look at it, uh, and then we can have further discussions from there. Um, it is just an alternative we think we need, if we're against tolls, that we need to place forward alternative that works and makes sense.